So um, the, our uh, final uh, guest lecturer is um, Elliot Tucker Dro. Um, Elliot is, got his PhD in psychology from the University of Virginia. Um, he is uh, one of the leading young behavior geneticists and um, uh, at the forefront of the development of new methods um, uh, for doing genomics and social science research. So uh, he's the perfect person to be uh, uh, presenting this lecture. Thanks, Elliot. All right, it's, it's great to be here. I've really enjoyed being here for the past few days. So thanks for the invitation. Um, so um, as you can see from the title, the, um, I'm going to be dis, uh, uh, discussing um, uh, uh, a method that um, I developed uh, to model the joint genetic architecture of uh, multiple GWAS traits. And that is a method that's called genomic structural equation modeling. Um, before I um, kind of move forward to the presentation, I want to acknowledge my two core collaborators in this work. So, Andrew Grotzinger, who actually was a, um, uh, a, a, a trainee of this workshop, I think in its first iteration, maybe. Um, and uh, it was in like New Jersey. I was on my sabbatical in Manhattan. He came in that weekend in between and we hung out in Central Park. And now he's, um, he's just finishing his clinical internship. Well, he just finished his clinical, clinical internship at MGH and he's started his faculty job at um, uh, Boulder at the Institute for Behavior Genetics in the Department of Psychology. So um, he deserves most of the credit. And then Michelle Nivard, who is our um, Dutch collaborator, who also, um, you know, it, I think all three of us really needed to come together to do this work. None of us could have done it on our own. So it was really fortuitous that we uh, linked up with Michelle fairly early on in this. Um, OK. so I'm. Just to give you a little bit of background here, and of course, this is stuff that you're going to be familiar with from the uh, past uh, week and a half. So here is the plot of the number of uh, independent loci dis discovered for um, uh, schizophrenia as a function of the uh, number of cases in the discovery sample. And that's also strongly correlated with when the paper was published. And you, I think you've probably seen this for educational attainment. So we see the same sort of story for all sorts of GWAS traits, including psychiatric traits, you know, in the um, uh, late noughties, so 2009, there were pretty much no discoveries. Um, most recently, we're up to, um, uh, what is it, upwards of 200, close to 300. Um, and actually, I've got the Manhattan plot here. So this is from the first, um, or one of the first uh, GWASs uh, for schizophrenia. It was about 20,000 uh, uh, participants. That included both cases and controls. And there were 11 hits. Uh, last year, there was a preprint pub, uh, put up that I think is still under review, uh, or I guess was just resubmitted. I wasn't part of it, but I heard through the grapevine. And yeah, 248. Um, you see this same sort of pattern for depression. In 2013, there weren't any hits. The sample size is about 20K. Um, more recently, it's up to 800,000, and there are 102 hits. And what I think is uh, nice about these two phenotypes is, um, for the purposes of my demonstration, is that what happened kind of over the past 10 or so years is that as more and more discoveries were made in GWAS, people started to notice that the discoveries were uh, oftentimes overlapping across different uh, GWAS traits. So, um, for example, there's this one variant with this RS number. I'm not going to read it out. Out uh, that um, it, that was discovered for schizophrenia actually in two different samples, once in 2015, once in 2017. It was a biologically plausible um, discovery because it's on a gene known to be involved in axonal outgrowth, and schizophrenia is a brain disorder. Um, it was associated in some imaging genetic studies with the volume of the uh, of the putamen, which is a brain region which is linked with emotion perception, which is something that is often impaired in schizophrenia. So it made a lot of biological sense. But then this variant was also found to be uh, associated with neuroticism and depression. So that kind of confused things because there was this um, draw to interpret the discovery specifically to the trait that it was discovered um, uh, uh, 
on, and then, uh, of course, it becomes relevant for a broader range of traits. And we could go through this, and we could cross-tabulate all of the different genome-wide significant discoveries for different traits, and start to look at the number of, of overlaps be, uh, overlapping hits between the different traits, but that would be a pretty difficult exercise because you have a big cross-tabulated table, and it would only really tell you about the genome-wide significant hits that overlapped, right? So those are going to be the ones that are probably going to have the largest effect. Perhaps that makes them special in some way. We'd really like to know about the genetic architecture shared more generally um, uh, uh, across the traits, including the variants that perhaps have yet to be discovered. And so this is what led to a number of different methods uh, that were first developed for estimating uh, SNP heritability and then genetic correlation very soon after. And you've also heard about these. I think Raymond talked about LD score regression. Here is my kind of one slide overview, or maybe two slide overview of LD score regression. Um, the, 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 the key premise behind LD score regression is that when we have variants, so in this case we've just got a rotated correlation matrix, and that is um, represents the correlations between the SNPs, and uh, we call that the, L, the LD matrix. I think this comes from Haploview, although I just found it on Google Images. Um, and we, what we can see is that there are some variants that have a lot of red, so they tend to be correlated with more, more, more highly and with more uh, variants that are proximal to them. Then there are other variants that have less red, so they, they are correlated, right? There are, they are in LD with adjacent variants, but not as many of them. And what we would expect to see is if that there was a heritable signal that was influencing the phenotype, the variants, TS, the genetic variants that had more LD would have stronger relations with the outcome. And the reason for that is because they are not just counting, we're not just counting their own signal in the association of the phenotype, but their signal is also being counted uh, or double counted by, by more adjacent variants. And if there, and in fact, if there's a bigger swath of a bigger LD block, we would expect there to be more, just on average, probabilistically, causal variants that would then have their effects become double counted. Whereas for this variant, which is pretty much uncorrelated, it's, it's only correlated with, with highly with one or two other variants, it's less likely to tag a causal variant, and so it's less, it's going to have on average a lower test statistic. So the basic idea behind LD score regression is that heritability is implied when the test statistics, in this case these are the squared Z statistics, so the chi-squared statistics, are, um, uh, are higher um, for variants that have higher LD scores, which an LD score is literally the average correlation, I think it might be squared correlation, between uh, the, the, the variants and all the other variants on the, um, on the array. So here is an example of what an LD score regression plot would, looks like. You don't often see these when you do these analyses, but here they bend the variants by their uh, uh, LD score, and you can see that the test statistic increases as, LD incre L, as the LD score increases, and that suggests heritability. The significance of this slope is the significance of the heritability, and if we do a little bit of math, which probably Raymond's already shown, we can convert the slope of the line into a heritability estimate. And what's really cool here is that instead of just taking the squared Z statistic on the y-axis, what we can instead do is multiply, instead of multiplying that Z statistic by itself, we can multiply it by the Z statistic for another trait. And what that does is it gives you an index of the extent to which the variants that are relevant for the first trait are also relevant for the second trait. And the reason for that is if you have a high Z statistic, that's indi indicative of a likely association. A high times a high would stay high. A high times something lower would be low, would be closer to zero, and a low times a low would be zero. So the Z statistic of the first trait times the second trait is just telling you how concordant the effect sizes tend to be between the two traits, and that's an index of genetic overlap or genetic correlation. If you take the slope of that line and now instead of it being the square Z statistic, it's the product, and you do the same sort of math that hopefully Raymond's already explained better than I could, and you figure out the genetic correlation or genetic covariance.
So when you do that, you can start to construct, construct matrices. You can put the heritabilities on a diagonal. We would just call those the genetic variances. And then the co-heritabilities or the genetic covariances off the diagonal. And here we have our first example of the simplest form of a genetic covariance matrix. And typically, we don't like to look at covariance matrices because they're in units that are hard for us to intuit. So we often convert them into genetic correlation matrices, which I'm sure you've all done for your problem set. So when we do that, um, we end up, and we do that for lots of traits, we end up with what's referred to as uh, sometimes as atlases, so heat maps of genetic correlations. Here's a paper that was published by the Brainstorm Consortium a few years ago. Um, what you, I wasn't part of this. Um, what you can see is that uh, they analyzed what they called common disorders of the brain, so psychiatric and neurological diseases mostly, and they also included some social GOS phenotypes like educational attainment, uh, personality, and whatnot. And what you can see here is, I think two, two things are worth noting. One is that there is a pretty extensive pattern of genetic correlation across a broad range of phenotypes. So it's not that you just get a, you know, a few hot spots surrounded by a whole bunch of zeros. You actually see sizable correlations in lots of different locations. So this is for psychiatric disorders with psychiatric disorders. This is for um, psychiatric and uh, neurological disorders with social factors. So the second observation is that even though genetic correlations are omnipresent, they're not homogeneous. There's a patterning here. So you can see, for example, I don't know if I could pick some out here, anxiety disorders and major depression, very dark blue. There's a strong degree of genetic sharing between anxiety and depression, much higher than the kind of average amount of genetic sharing that you would see if you were to just average across all the cells in the matrix. And so the purpose of the, the, the genomic structural equation modeling, it's a method that I'm going to be talking about, is really to understand this patterning and to exploit it for a, a number of, of, of different um, goals. So if we've got, you know, I guess just to take a step back, as of this brainstorm paper, my perception in the field was that this was, that the finding was the genetic correlations. You did your analysis and you stopped at the results, the results being the genetic correlations. And my critique here is that that's well and good when these matrices are, you know, 10 by 10 or even a little bit bigger. But as the number of GWAS phenotypes that you genetically correlate gets larger and larger, the number of cells gets even larger. It's the, you know, it's actually the number of phenotypes times the number of phenotypes minus one divided by two. That's the number of cells. So it's, it increases faster than the number of phenotypes increases. And then you end up with a big data problem, again, even after you've already processed your, you know, million to 10 million GWAS, uh, uh, variants in GWAS, you're still with a result that is itself potentially very high dimensional. And so what I would argue is that rather than a, a, an atlas of genetic correlations being a result in and of itself, it's actually a starting point or at least a waypoint, and it's in need of further analysis. So if we have a genetic atlas, what can we do with it? One thing we can do is we can treat the correlations as data to be modeled, not simply as results in and of themselves. We can ask questions like what data generating process gave rise to the correlations. We can ask whether a high dimensional matrix of genetic correlations amongst many phenotypes can be uh, closely approximated by a low dimensional representation, so a model with a very small number of free parameters. Uh, we can incorporate these models into um, multivariate GWAS. We can use our knowledge of genetic correlations and the dimensions that might underlie them to structure our GWASs to, for example, find variants that aren't simply related to depression, but related to a, um, uh, a broader dimension of negative emotionality that also underlies anxiety. Um, we can use those multivariate GWAS results to create polygenic indices. Um, so for instance, a recent paper uh, that, I, that I played a part in uh, uh, did a GWAS of what they refer to as externalizing psychopathology, which is a general dimension of risk taking that relates to substance use, risky sex, um, 
driving past the speed limit, all sorts of different things. Um, and they created a polygenic index to represent that on the basis of their multivariate GWAS, and they used that polygenic index in prediction samples. Um, we can also, I'll talk about this at the very end, in another paper, uh, we uh, uh, took the educational attainment GWAS, removed the signal that was uh, evident, uh, that, that came from the uh, intelligence or cognitive ability GWAS, and what we were left with is a residual signal that we referred to as, um, as the non-cognitive portion of educational attainment. So all the things that dispose you to go further in school that are not related to your cognitive ability. So these might be things like um, uh, intellectual curiosity, self-control, planfulness, organization. Um, so this framework, as you can't really see from the title, is called Genomic Structural Equation Modeling. It's blanked out here. Um, and so the, the thing that I really want to emphasize about it is that this is a methodological framework. It's not a model. Sometimes I see people saying, you know, we compare genomic SEM to some other method, and it's, well, the, you can't really say that. You have to say what model within genomic SEM you compared. Um, in some cases, in many cases, actually, we can actually take other people's models that are based on other software pa packages and specify them in genomic SEM, and we've got an equivalent model with equivalent results. So genomic SEM is not necessary, it's not a model. It is a way of fitting user-specified models. And because it's flexible, that means that you can specify a, mo a model that fits your own goals, which um, is nice when in the broader kind of universe of GWAS uh, software, you're often just kind of pointing and clicking. Although perhaps that's, that's not charitable enough to the other software. Um, <laughs> uh, it is based, because it is based in LD score regression, it only requires GWAS summary statistics. Um, so you don't need raw data, although if you've got it and you want to first GWAS the phenotypes yourself, that's perfectly fine. Um, again, because it's based in LD score regression, it, it allows you to estimate genetic correlations between phenotypes that haven't necessarily been measured in the same people, or perhaps they have been and you don't know the extent of the overlap. That's okay because as probably you learned uh, in the LD score regression sessions last week, um, the, uh, the, the sample overlap is absorbed into the LD square regression intercept and not into the slope of that line relating LD square to the test statistics. So um, it's, uh, it's robust to sample overlap, um, or it's not biased, and neither are standard errors by sam sample overlap. And it's also, it's, uh, just to mention, this is it's all impl Im implemented in R. And if you're used to working in R, um, you should start to find it fairly intuitive. The way that the models are set up look a lot like the LM function, where you've got y tilde x. And the, that's, the, that's the basis of the, of the modeling language, is, are things like y tilde x. So it, it should be fairly straightforward. And we have a wiki that walks people through examples. So before I get to the genomic part of structural equation modeling, I just want to give some intuition um, by way of example of how structural equation modeling works. How does it model covariances? And this is something that you um, uh, should have gotten a little bit of experience with the problem sets uh, that, that you completed. Um, but imagine, uh, we're going to do kind of do this backwards. Imagine we actually knew the data generating model. So in reality, we don't have, we don't know what the model is and we don't know the parameters from the model. We have to propose a model, estimate the parameters, and hopefully the model is correct and the parameters are unbiased. But suppose we knew the, the data generating model. And um, in this case, we've just got x predicting y with a standardized coefficient of 0.4. There it is for those of you who don't like path diagrams in, you know, the kind of, you know, left-hand side, right-hand side sort of specific specification. Suppose we also knew that y affected z with a coefficient of 0.6. Why z? 0.6, there it is. Um, what that, would it, what that would tell us is actually what we should expect to see in the entire covariance matrix between x, y, and z. We would expect that x and y to be correlated. I mean, it's a covariance in this case, but I've specified all of the variances to one. Co to be correlated at 0.4, comes from right here. y and z should be correlated at 0.6. That's super easy. But we'd also expect x and z to be correlated at 0.24, and that's because of the indirect effect of x on z by way of y. And the way you get that 
if you read that two-page McCardell and Boker uh, handout, which is, uh, you know, I know a tricky read, it'd be 0.4 times 0.6. It's the, 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 if in path analysis language, the, um, the, a compound path is simply the product of the constituent paths. But, you know, we could specify this with matrix algebra and um, do the same thing. Okay, so in reality, we don't know the generating model. We have to propose a model. And we don't know the population matrix. We only have a sample, a, cor a correlation or covariance matrix from a sample. And so the covariance matrix itself is only an approximation of the true covariance matrix. So in this case, I've just kind of added some noise and we see that you know the diagonals aren't exactly one. The, um, the, the 0.4 that we should expect to see is really just a 0.33. The 0.24 is a 0.27, et cetera. And this has nothing to do with the model being wrong. This just has to do with the fact that when we sample from a finite population, we sample with some variability. And then what we do is we take that observed data. So in this case, the observed data is the observed covariance matrix. And we propose a model. In this case, I'm going to propose the correct model, but I'm still not going to know what the, what the parameters are. So I've guessed right in this case. Of course, no, we don't normally know if we've guessed right. Uh, about what the model looks like, but these these betas are free parameters, and so are the, the variances and residuals actually. So in this case, what you can see is we have um, six unique elements in our covariance matrix. So in this case, since we're including the diagonal, it's k for the number of phenotypes times k plus one divided by two, um, which in layman's language, we've got a three by three matrix the diagonal we want to save, so we keep those three. Then what we have uh, left is we've got six elements, but they're redundant with one another, so we divide those by two, and that gets three. And we take the three that we saved from the diagonal, add those back to the three that we uh, eliminated, uh, that we kept after eliminating redundancy, and we're at six observations. So we've got six observations in our data, and observations now are cells in a matrix, not individual people. And we've got a model with five free parameters, one variance, two residual variances, two regression parameters. We could have saturated this model and actually estimated one more free parameter, which would be this direct effect of x on y, which I didn't do. So in this case, I've got a slightly more parsimonious model than I have data. So that means this model is falsifiable. Um, uh, I can estimate the parameters that minimize the difference between the model implied matrix and the observed matrix. And when I do that, I get basically, in, in this case, the, you know, what is essentially the least squares regression estimates, because it's just a system of regression equations. Um, and so when I actually do this, I end up with a 0.35 here, a 0.61 here. I uh, multiply the paths together, and those produce 0.20 we can compare this model implied matrix to our sample matrix and see how close it gets. And we can use things like a chi-squared statistics to test the extent to which the model deviates more than we would expect due to chance alone from the sample data. OK, so we don't just have to estimate these um, uh, series of regression coefficients amongst observables. We can actually also. Uh, create models in which some of the variables are unobserved. So in this case, f has not been GWAS, it hasn't been measured. I'm just going to propose that the reason that y1 through y5 are correlated is because they're all affected by a factor that I'm calling f. I don't measure that factor, I just say that it affects the variables. I specify the model with these parameters free. Since I haven't measured the factor, it has no intrinsic unit, so I'm going to just say that it's got a variance of 1. And what you can see is this is a model that has these five parameters free, these five residuals free. It's got 10 free parameters. Um, uh, and the question is, is that identifiable? Do I have enough information in my matrix to estimate that model? Well, it turns out I do because I've got five measured variables. That's five times uh, five plus one divided by two. So that would be um, uh, five times six divided by two, 15. So I could have estimated up to 15 parameters. I'm only estimating 10. This is a model that is over-identified, meaning that it can be, uh, uh, there is a unique solution 
the solution, because this model is more parsimonious than the original data, the unique solution may not perfectly recapture the data. And then the question is, does it recapture the data within a given level of tolerance? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go through all of the path tracing or the model implied co correlation matrices. But what you can see is you could even specify two factors that are correlated, and those factors don't have to be observed in your data at all. As long as you've got what's referred to as indicators of those factors, you should probably mm -hmm. be OK. OK, so that's how structural equation modeling works. People have been doing that with covariance matrices estimated using raw data and no genetics for a very long time. What genomic structural equation modeling does is it applies that same sort of methodology instead of to observed covariance matrices that are just calculated using you know, the cove function in R or whatever economists use in Stata or whatever you guys use. Um, uh, it, we're using uh, 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 genetic correlations. And because, and because genetic correlations can be between variables that aren't necessarily measured in the same sample, and because a genetic correlation doesn't have a standard error that is proportional to the sample size in the normal way, there's a lot of math that needs to be worked out in order to make this possible. But we've worked it out, and I'm mostly not going to go through it here. Um, but the basic idea is that it's a two-stage estimation approach in which in stage one, we estimate the genetic covariance matrix. And the second matrix, which is a matrix uh, that uh, is called the sampling covariance matrix. And what that has is it's got the standard errors, well, actually the squared standard errors of each of the um, estimates in the correlation or the covariance matrix. And it also has what's referred to as the sampling codependencies, the extent to which if you have an overestimate estimate for one parameter, you're also likely to have an overestimate for another parameter. If you've got over, sample overlap and it's between variables that are correlated, you tend to find that when you kind of overestimate one thing, you tend to overestimate another thing, and we need to take that into account. And that sample overlap actually also, uh, that, that V matrix is what it's called. It actually also is derived from the LD score regression methodology, but rather than using the cross trait intercept, which is used for other things that I'll get to, uh, we actually, we use the jackknife method. It's a resampling method that is used in LD score regression originally, but instead of just jackknifing the standard errors, we can also jackknife the off diagonals in order to get those sampling codependencies. And so once we have those two matrices, we, fit, we specify the structural equation model, we optimize the model to the um, uh, stage one matrix, and we uh, um, uh, obtain the parameter estimates and their standard errors. Okay, so let's, let me show you how to do that. I guess I kind of already uh, said it, but I've actually got some visualization. So you start with GWAS summary statistics. So you've probably seen stuff like this. I mean, I often show this to people who've never done GWAS before because it's, it's kind of hard to think about this stuff abstractly. What are we talking about when we talk about GWAS summary statistics? And I mean, it's pretty simple, right? We've got the SNP ID. We've got um, which allele is the effect allele. We've got the effect size, in this case it's an odds ratio because it's uh, a case control trait. You've got the standard error. I think actually often, you gotta check the readmes on these files. Often it's a standard error on the logistic regression even though they report the odds ratio. So it's a huge pain. You gotta figure out what they're doing. Sample sizes, minor little frequency. Um, but that's, that's where you start. Um, you estimate um, the genetic correlation or the covariance matrix. Um, using LD score regression. In this case, we use the LD score regression function in the genomic SEM package because it doesn't just give you the genetic covariances and heritabilities, but it gives you that second matrix that has its off diagonals, which represent the sampling codependencies. Uh, that's what this looks like. You can see it's bigger than the first because not all, because on the diagonal of this V matrix is every single cell here. And then the off diagonal is the dependency between the estimation errors of every single uh, cell of the first matrix. So it's a much bigger matrix. So we call that V. And then we propose a model, which we just say, you know, it's a, it's a model uh, that we just kind of, uh, oh, sorry, we propose a model that, that implies a, a covariance matrix as a function of model parameters. So we just refer to the model parameters as theta. So that's just a big set of betas, for instance, if you're just fitting a bunch of regressions. And then 
you do the path tracing rules and the matrix algebra to produce the model implied covariance matrix. But all of those parameters are unknown. So theta is unknown. And what we do is we optimize the model to the data as a weighted function of the V matrix. So this weight right here in the middle, that's the inverse of the V matrix. We actually use a diagonalized V matrix because that really stabilizes the estimates. And then we go back and we use a sandwich correction to uh, take into account the off diagonals. And for those of you who've always heard about sandwich corrections, you want to know why is it called a sandwich correction? I've always, I always used to wonder this. Like you think, well, oh, something being like, so I don't have the, 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 the equation here, but basically what it is is you've got some matrix in the middle. And then on either side of that matrix are two other matrices. One being, so it's being pre-multiplied and post-multiplied, I guess, by the transpose of, of, of pre-multiplied by the matrix and post-multiplied by the transpose. And then outside of that, you've got two other matrices. that are, And it looks like you've got bread, lettuce, and meat. And it's called sandwich estimator because it's five matrices typically, and it's got the bread, lettuce, and meat. And actually, I think in the genomic sim code, we actually call them bread, lettuce, and meat. Um, I mean, you'd have to go into the GitHub to find that. You don't ever need to deal with that yourself. But that's why they're called sandwich estimators. So Hubert White, like robust sandwich estimator, that's what they are. Um, and we uh, obtain model fit statistics, some of which are familiar to people, like chi-square and a AIC. CFI is a structural equation modeling fit index that is often used. We have to rederive all of those because they are, the original equations are based on sample size. And sample size doesn't really, there is no real sample size when it comes to genetic correlations. So we have to do it on the basis of the precision of the estimates rather than the sample sizes themselves. Okay, so, let's show, so let me show some examples of how we do this. So the first question you might have or that, that people have had is they used to do this quite a bit. That, you know, you, you find the genetic correlation between one phenotype and another, and another phenotype and another, and the first two, they are also correlated. So in this case, well, schizophrenia genetics and bipolar genetics are correlated. They're both correlated to educational attainment. And then you're sitting around to the, you know, at, a, at a working group meeting and you get a whole bunch of people arguing. Well, is the only reason that the bipolar genetics are associated with, with educational attainment because bipolar is associated with schizophrenia and it's really schizophrenia genetic liability that's associated with educational attainment? Or do, are they tapping two distinct sort of signals even though they're somewhat genetically correlated? And you can go through that, that sort of argument for days if you stare at a matrix like this. And go, oh, the 0.5 is lower than the 0.27, so maybe, maybe it's just the bipolar that's related. These are old. These, uh, we actually did this to replicate um, some earlier analyses that were done using a different methodology. So these correlations come from some old summary statistics. They're not, I think this correlation is a little bit higher these days when you use the most recent summary statistics for schizophrenia and bipolar. And I don't know how it works with EA. Um, but anyhow, this is, we used some outdated data just to get to, to show this point. So what you can do is you can just do what is normal within social sciences, which is run a regression with both predictors that are correlated and see whether or not one predictor predicts the outcome above and beyond the other and vice versa. That's what it would look like, almost like an LM and R, but this is actually the genomic SEM model. The big difference is that we actually directly specify that the predictors are correlated. So I think in R, in the LM, you would just have this top line. Um, this is what it looks like as a path diagram. So we're looking at whether or not educational attainment is uniquely predictive, predicted by schizophrenia genetics above and beyond bipolar genetics and vice versa. Is, by, is it uniquely predicted by polar genetics above and beyond schizophrenia genetics? And when we fit that model, what we see is very clearly that it's really that bipolar genetics are kind of specifically related to educational attainment. Schizophrenia was just along for the ride. Right? It doesn't have a unique path anymore. Okay, so that's just kind of the most simple um, kind of application. In fact, this is a model that doesn't, re it's not any more parsimonious than the original data. It's a th zero degree of freedom model. It has as many free parameters as the original matrix. So it's just a transformation of the matrix. Um, here's another example that uh, we use. So these uh, were um, anthropometric um, GWASs, so GWAS of things like um, body max index, um, uh, waist hip ratio, waist circumference, uh, height. We also have infant head circumference, uh, birth weight, birth length. And um, what we did here is we actually fit a, an exploratory factor analysis, which I won't get into for the time being, but um, 
we fit this exploratory factor analysis, it suggested perhaps two factors were appropriate. So we specified this model within genomic sim that um, to represent what we thought might be going on. And when we fit the model to the data, what you see is you indeed find that there are these two factors that are, one is just kind of adult, being, being overweight, mostly it's adult phenotypes and it has more to do with BMI, and then another early life growth uh, factor, and the two are genetically correlated fairly low, 0.11. So these are two factors that are very kind of distinguishable, but they capture uh, genetic variation within clusters that, are, that, that is quite uh, shared. And what we did here is we just took the correlation matrix, and I, I, I want to um, avoid you thinking that this is easier than it is. Because if you have a genetic correlation matrix, you would not necessarily have it ordered like this. You might have it randomly ordered, and it would look like a big mosaic with a bunch of dark spots and light spots, and it would be very hard to make sense of it without some sort of algorithm or some sort of previous knowledge. But in this case, because our exploratory factor analysis suggested this structure, I've ordered the, uh, the variables in the matrix such that the, uh, the overweight fact, uh, variables come first and the, underweight, and the uh, early life growth factors come second. And what you can see is you've got this cluster of very highly genetically correlated traits, another cluster of genetically co co highly correlated traits. And then you've got the cross-cluster correlations that's, quite, that's a, a, a good bit lower. And if you were to produce the model-implied matrix, so the matrix that this model implies, it looks a whole lot like the observed matrix. But what you can see is it looks a little bit more perfect. Right? And this is kind of the, the core part of modeling, is that you're trying to identify the kind of key features that are important to you as a human and as a researcher while perhaps smoothing over some nuance. And so the question is, isn't, does this model fit perfectly? The question is, does this model fit adequately? Does it recapture the most important aspects? And I think you can see qualitatively that it does. By the standards of structural equation modeling model fit, it's also a pretty good fit. You want to see CFI is generally above 0.9. Standardized root mean square residuals less than 0.1, and we're getting that. Um, I love this quote. This is a quote by George Box, who, I don't know, it's kind of a blend of an academic and a spousal great-grandparent, because he was my wife's mom's PhD advisor. And it says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think that really captures what I like about um, uh, this, this example. Okay, so the next example, and as a psychologist now, we're getting closer to the sorts of things that I, I tend to be interested in, is um, the idea of genetic sharing in psychiatric diseases. And um, uh, here are a couple papers that were done by Caspi and Moffitt, kind of with phenotypic data. And what they proposed is that there was a general dimension of liability that conferred risk to a broad range of different psychiatric traits. And so um, they call that the P factor. And you see they have these catchy, catchy titles like all for one and one for all, mental disorders in one dimension. Mm -hmm. So our question is, what, what does at the genetic level, what does the kind of multivariate structure of mental disorders really look like? And what's really cool here is the phenotypic work was mostly done in, by the standards of cohorts were pretty large cohorts. But nevertheless, if you're dealing with disorders that have prevalence rates of one out of 100 or even lower, you're not going to have a large proportion of people with the disorder. So what you're basically confining yourself to do is studying common disorders. You also, like, even if you do have a substantial proportion of people with the disorder, it's still maybe too low in order to get the cross tabs of the comorbid disorders, right? If you, you know, autism is very rare. Um, uh, Schizophrenia is very rare. The two overlapping are even rarer. There's also going to be some differential diagnosis problems about uh, diagnosing someone with schizophrenia if they have autism. Um, and what we can do with genomics is, one, is increase the sample size substantially. Two, is we don't need to rely on comorbidity we can, in order to get a genetic correlation. In fact, we can estimate these genetic correlations between traits that we're measuring completely non-overlapping samples. 
And what we can also do is we can estimate genetic correlations between traits that are exclusion criteria for one another. If you have major depression, then you have a manic episode, you're probably going to uh, be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and they're going to remove the depression diagnosis from your file. So it's very hard to ask to what extent do people with bipolar disorder also have major depression. They're, that doesn't exist. That's just, I think, bipolar 1 is what you would typically call that. Um, uh, but since we don't require sample overlap, we can actually get at that genetic sharing. OK, so in our first um, attempt at getting at this, we just started with five disorders. Um, we fit a single common factor to the data. The factor model fit the data pretty well, but we didn't have very many disorders. We kind of were picking ones that we kind of already knew from the literature were already genetically correlated. So like this is really more of a proof of concept than, than anything confirmatory. But we find this general uh, uh, factor that we call P because Caspian Moffat called it P, and it's this general factor of psychopathology underlying schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety disorders. And this was just in the methodological paper that introduced um, genomic structural equation modeling. Um, what we went on to do is to team up with the PGC Cross Disorder Group. They had been working on a paper for a while, and we just were very lucky enough to get in right at the time in which they um, were analyzing their data, so we didn't have to wait for all of the data freezes, which can take years. And um, we, they were working with um, these eight disorders, and we um, fit uh, uh, a, a number of different models to the data. We actually did, um, uh, ideally you would do like a discovery and, confirm, and, a, and, a, and a confirmatory sample. It's very hard to do when you're dealing with summary statistics, because that would require people to split their samples and then um, uh, 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 rerun the GWASs. So what we actually did is we did something that I thought was pretty clever. It was Michelle's idea, which was to do our exploratory um, uh, factor analyses in the odd-numbered chromosomes, and then do our confirmatory models in the even-numbered chromosomes. And th those tend to be independent if, you know, there's, if, if stratification has been corrected for, and there's, you shouldn't expect long-range LD across chromosomes. So it, um, we were able to correct for some of the sort of overfitting that you might get when you don't have a structure known a priori, you need to do some exploratory analyses. So we ended up with these three factors. We call them the compulsive disorders, which include things like anorexia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and Tourette syndrome, psychotic disorders, which were primarily schizophrenia and bipolar, but also there was a loading of major depression, which was a little bit weird, and then the neurodevelopmental disorders, which included ADHD and autism. Mm -hmm. We suspected that this major depressive disorder loading was, was sitting here kind of partly under the neurodevelopmental factor, partly under the psychotic factor, because it just didn't, it didn't have any buddies with it. You can see there's no anxiety disorders in, in this. If you're familiar with treatment for anxiety disorders, they basically prescribe you the same serotonin reuptake inhibitors that they described for depression. It, it, it's affected by a lot of the same mechanisms. They're both strongly correlated with the personality uh, uh, trait known as neuroticism. There's good reason to expect there to be an internalizing disorders factor, but because we only have one internalizing disorder, we're not seeing, we're not getting at that factor. So what we've done more recently is we've expanded even further to include as many disorders as we could get our hands on at the, at the time. Um, we added alcohol use disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety disorder. And indeed, we ended up with an internalizing factor, which we're calling factor four. The first three factors are by and large the same factors that we uh, that we reported on in the cell paper um, last year. So, um, uh, and that was after redoing the exploratory analyses using the same sort of pipeline. So we're seeing both that there's consistency with our previous work as we kind of extend the range of phenotypes and also update to the newest sample sizes for most of the GWASs, um, but also elaboration. Um, so you might say, well, this is all well and good. It's, it's structuring patterns of association between disorders and one another. But does that mean that the, that the disorders that cluster together are also going to uh, exhibit more similar patterns of genetic association with external variables? So as a kind of interesting and fun proof of concept, what we did is we genetically correlated the uh, factors or the individual disorders, but kind of color coded them by the factor that our structural equation models suggested uh, they should go with, 
we genetically correlated them with circadian rhythm. And by circadian rhythm, what I'm referring to is the amount of movement that was measured in um, about 100,000 UK biobank individuals with an accelerometer throughout the day. So you should expect to see for kind of someone with a normal wake sleep cycle for there to be very little movement at night and more movement during the day. And what you can see, which I thought was pretty, pretty interesting and, and, and a nice kind of validation, is that the compulsive disorders um, kind of all show the same sort of uh, pattern of increasing activity um, throughout the 24-hour cycle, kind of beginning in the early morning and continuing throughout the day. Um, the neurodevelopmental disorders were highly active in the early morning hours and activity declined um, throughout the day and then kind of stayed flat except for this autism, uh, we, we did see a little bit of a deviation. See kind of similar patterns as for the internalizing disorders uh, amongst one another, et cetera. So the idea here is that we, we're seeing that the patterns of external associations between variables that were grouped together on the basis of their associations with another, one, one another tend to be homogeneous within those clusters. Do you have a question? Pat? I'm confused about this picture. So yeah. what, what, what is each dot? So these are RGs for, like, we did GWASs? And... Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think Peter Vischer did the GWASs. At, at every one hour um, bin throughout the 24-hour day, and then we genetically correlated um, each, the summary statistics for each uh, disorder with those one hour activity levels. And then we basically lowest smoothed across the individual estimates. So the idea would be that like if there's a high genetic correlation at, at one, that means the, the variation that explains how active people are at 1 AM is, is, is highly genetically correlated with um, I don't know, ADHD. Is that? Yeah, so okay, so ADHD is in green. So we've got ADHD. So higher genetic liability to ADHD is associated with greater movement at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and 3 a.m., and lower movement at uh, 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Doesn't mean that people who have ADHD, I mean, it could mean that, but that people who have ADHD have this pattern, but people who have the genetic profile that tends to be found in people with ADHD tend to have this pattern. Yes. So that's kind of what this is doing because these are not mean levels; they're correlations. So people who don't have the genetic risk for the disorder have a lower um, kind of latent genetic uh, score on, let's say, the ADHD genetic factor. So the the fact that the correlation is high means that people with High genetic risk for ADHD tend to be moving more at 1 a.m. and people with lower genetic risk for ADHD, so people who are probably we call normal or non-patient controls, have, uh, I mean, we're probably all at ADHD, ADHD over here, but we're weird, um, uh, have uh, less uh, movement than the, than, than the average person in the UK biobank sample. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, what I'll talk about next is how we use these sorts of models to um, uh, 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 guide multivariate discoveries. So we basically are able to kind of reconduct GWAS, but now the GWAS target is no longer the original GWAS trait. It's perhaps a, fa it's, it's a factor that is composed of multiple GWAS traits. So the way that we do this kind of pragmatically in the first stage is we need to append a new vector or column to our genetic covariance matrix. So the blue portion is the original genetic covariance matrix that we already talked about. It's estimated using LD score regression. The red portion is a is are basically the GWAS betas. They're actually the GWAS betas multiplied by 2PQ. So it's a COVID, you're turning a beta into a covariance and the way you do that is multiply that by the variance. Um, we also expand the V matrix, and the way that we do that is we specifically use the cross trait intercepts, which it turns out are a, uh, an index of the dependency between the standard errors of these GWAS betas, and we, we add that to uh, as, a, as, a, as another block into, this, uh, in, into the V matrix. Um, 
And then we fit a model that looks like this. So originally, and I'm just showing it for a single factor, but you can do it with multiple factors. So originally we wouldn't have the SIP in the model, we just have the factor model. Right? And we, the free parameters would just be these factor loadings, which are basically regression coefficients relating the unobserved factor or the kind of general dimension that underlies the traits to the traits themselves, uh, or the genetic components of the traits themselves. And now what we do is regress that factor on the, on the SNP. And we do that one SNP at a time on loop for as many SNPs as you want to do it for. And you know, what, do, what do GWAS results look like? Well, if you discover the genome-wide significant hits for, let's say, the psychotic disorders, and then go back to the original GWASs for the indicators of the psychotic disorders, so schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and you look at their betas or z-statistics, you see that they're both elevated, right? So this was a genome-wide significant hit for the psychotic disorder because it was itself strongly related to schizophrenia and bipolar, and it wasn't particularly related to any of the other GOS traits included in, in the analysis. Now, what's important, and a really important point, is that this is not just saying that schizophrenia and bipolar both are genome-wide significant on their own. They could both be sub-threshold. They could have, be five times sense of negative fifth, but by pooling the data across schizophrenia and bipolar and using the appropriate weights that are estimated in the model, the p-value of the joint association through the factor can exceed five times ten to negative eight, or become more significant than times five times ten to negative eight. So I think that's a really important point. This is not simply cross-tabulating significance across the contributing phenotype GWASs. It's it is conducting its own kind of meta-analysis that is informed and specifically. Um, constrained by the structure of the, of the model that we proposed. Here's an example for internalizing disorders. You get the same sort of thing that you'd expect, that the, the genome-wide significant hit for the internalizing disorder factor is actually a variant that is most strongly associated with anxiety and depression. And I think this is an important point. Not only have we potentially increased power, but now we're able to say something that I think is probably a little bit more accurate. Rather than saying this is a depression SNP and then someone else saying this is an anxiety SNP and then the two groups coming together and saying, oh, this is relevant for both depression and anxiety, huh, what do you think? We say this is a SNP that's related to a general dimension of liability towards negative emotionality that we call internalizing. And hence, it's related to risk for both depression and anxiety. Okay, so you might ask, just going back to the L LD score regression kind of genetic correlation matrix, is the factor model correct? We've, we, we're using factor models quite a bit. I mean, not exclusively. You can do whatever modeling you want. Um, but you might say, well, we're starting with this observation, which is just a heat map with a bunch of positive associations, in this case, between four phenotypes. This is just a, a, uh, a thought experiment now. And we said, well, they're all correlated, so maybe they're all correlated because they're all affected by the same underlying dimension. So we fit that model, and we get a whole bunch of 0.7s, which, if you remember how to do this, 0.7 times 0.7 is the model implied correlation between the two indicators. It's actually 0.7 times 1 times 0.7, but I left the one out. And um, that's 0.49, so we, I, this is just a heat map that has a bunch of 0.49s in it. So, you know, that's plausible. The model is consistent with the data, but that's not the only model. Here's something that people who um, have been interested in factor models outside of genetics have been really struggling with for about 100 years, which is that when you see, sorry, let me go back once, this, what they refer to as a positive manifold of correlations. So it's just a matrix with a bunch of positive values in it. We say that they're, well, that's consistent with a factor model, but it could also be consistent with what I would refer to as a process or pairwise overlap model. So here we say, well, Y1 and Y2 are correlated because they're both affected by this first factor. And so there's the correlation. And Y2 and Y3 are correlated because they're both affected by the second factor, which is completely orthogonal to the first. And now I've populated two cells of the matrix. And I've done so in a way that suggests maybe there's a general dimension. But what we can see is actually Y1 and Y3 are not affect affected by any of the same causal factors. 
And we could propagate this forward. I didn't do it for every single one, but we could build out a matrix that results from a whole bunch of pairwise genetic sharing between traits, even if there aren't genetic factors that are related to all of the traits. And this is a big problem, because that means that if, we, that, that if we look at a positive manifold and we fit a factor model, maybe what we're doing is we're just kind of confirming our own biases rather than doing anything of substance. Okay, so this is kind of, we have these two alternatives. These models are exactly the same. Um, one of my new grad students, uh, Maggie Clapp, and I are actually building out these simulations to be a, a lot more complex in a way that we think approximates what we would really see. And we can still produce models without a whole bunch of tuning that are, are sorry, correlation matrices without a whole bunch of tuning that look completely identical when the causal pathways are very different. One is general factor, the other is some sort of um, uh, overlap between different, uh, or genetic sharing between different subgroups uh, of disorders, even though there's no genetic variants that are associated with all the disorders. Okay, so it turns out that when, by including the SNPs in the model, we actually are now gaining our leverage back to distinguish between the models. If the SNP is relevant for the factor, we should, ex I made this light blue, but still perceptible. In reality, this would be so light that you wouldn't be able to see it because SNP effects are very small. But what we should expect to see is that the SNP should be associated with all the individual indicators of that factor if the SNP is actually acting on the general dimension. Whereas if the SNP is only acting on two, you know, a pair of the, the variables, even though the genome-wide genetic correlation matrix is a positive manifold, the SNP effects should only be evident and in this case, two out of four of the outcomes. And this, this sort of expectation is, provides um, a ton of, of, of tractability to this problem that I'm talking about. So, um, oh, I should also just very briefly say that we should also expect under the factor model to have some SNPs that don't act on the factor. And that doesn't mean the factor model is wrong. Because the factor model suggests that there's a general dimension that underlies a, a large proportion of the variation in each of the individual phenotypes, but not all of it. Which means that there are also, I didn't represent them down here, unique factors that are specific to the phenotypes. So even for the internalizing disorders, even if the model is correct, we should still be able to find some SNPs that are just relevant for depression and others that are just relevant for anxiety. But many of the SNPs that we'll, we'll find will be relevant for both. What if you have a hierarchy of factors? Um, we, yeah, we, I mean, we, we're doing that in our simulations, and um, we actually, and actually in our, in the Grotzinger paper that I'm going to show results from, we actually fit a model where we have a hierarchy. So we've got a general factor on top, and then sub-factors or group factors are sometimes called down at the middle, and then the individual phenotypes at the bottom. Couldn't that produce any kind of pattern in theory? Um, the no, the hierarchy is still fairly constraining. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I mean, those models have a lot of degrees of freedom in them, which means that they're simplifying the raw data quite a bit. And then once you include the SNPs, same sort of thing. You know, they, um, and it's, well, let me take a step back. What I'm going to show you is how to discern between SNP effects and act on factors and those that don't act on factors. Now, if they don't act on the factor, they could act either uniquely on the individual disorders, they could act on subsets of the disorders, but not all of them. The statistic that I'm going to describe, which is what we call the heterogeneity statistic, Q, um, is very good at discerning between factor SNPs and non-factor SNPs. But amongst the alternative possibilities, um, that it, it's silent on it. So if we find a SNP, if we find a SNP that violates the factor model, it could violate the factor model because it's specific to Y1, or because it's specific to Y1, Y2, and Y3, but not Y4 and Y5, for example. So um, I mean, I think there's ways. If you're interested in very specific types of models that you want to compare that aren't factor models, those sorts of models could also be developed. You know, tests to discern between them could also be developed. But I'm in this case going to be really interested in the factor model. Yeah. How do you determine if something is a factor SNP or non-factor SNP? That's where I'm going to show you right next. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the path diagram that compares the two models. So we have this model, which is the one that is, I showed already, which is what we're referring to as a common factor, a common pathway model. So this model 
forces the SNP associations with the, with the individual indicators to be filtered through the factor. So in problem set, uh, in the problem set that you uh, did yesterday, um, uh, I gave an example where um, it turns out that the vector of SNP phenotype associations, or I said external correlate uh, phenotype associations, um, was uh, uh, nearly perfectly correlated with a vector of factor loadings, which is what you would expect if the factor model holds. And the reason for that is because you, the model implied relation between this SNP and Y1 is B times lambda 1, and between this SNP and Y2 is B times lambda 2. So in every case, it's just the loading times B. So actually, the slope of the regression line relating the, um, the, the, uh, the, the loadings to the SNP uh, indicator associations is the um, uh, estimate of the beta. Um, but I, I think that was the, sec the penultimate example was that. The, the final example actually had an, uh, was a situation in which that regression line didn't fit the, 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 the uh, scatter plot for the correlated vectors well at all. There was one um, indicator who had, that had a pronounced association with the SNP is much higher than would be expected on the basis of its factor loading. So that would be an indicator that um, perhaps has a preferential association with that one SNP. So it could be a, a, a SNP that is relevant just for depression and not anxiety, for example. But anyhow, this is the, 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 so the COM pathway model is what we're using to structure our multivariate GWAS. But we fit this other model, which we call the independent pathways model. And this model freely estimates Every effect of the SNP on uh, of, of, of the SNP on each of the indicators and specifies no effect on the factor at all. And so what you can see here is that if for K phenotypes, there are K minus one uh, more free parameters here than there are here. You're estimating one free parameter for the SNP effect here, and in this case, you're estimating K free parameters. So you, these are these models are nested within one, within one another, which means you can compare them with a chi square. Uh, test with degrees of freedom equal to k minus 1. And the significance of that test tells you the extent to which this model underperforms relative to this model, meaning it tells you the extent to which the factor model implies a pattern of SNP effects that is, that, that is inconsistent with the data. So anything in which that chi-square significance test is significant is going to be a SNP that is that violates a factor model and uh, e that potentially is acting just on a subset of the indicators. Okay, so here's just the classic example of what a Q genome-wide significant Q statistic SNP looks like. This is a variant in the alcohol dehydrogenase 1B gene, ADH1B. This is a variant, this is a gene that is well known, and Dan talked about it for having a very specific uh, uh, biology associated with the metabolism of alcohol. And so what we would expect to see is that this is a variant that has a specific effect on alcohol use or alcohol use disorder, but not necessarily a broad or general effect on many different traits. Now, a Mendelian randomization analysis would imply that, that SNP would still have some associations with other traits if drinking more alcohol disposes you towards um, uh, psychiatric disease. And uh, we fit a, a, a model like that, and it looks like maybe there was some evidence for that, but it, it's certainly a, a mo uh, the, the, the pattern is certainly a, a inconsistent with just a simple SNP affects the factors, and therefore it affects uh, alcohol use. This SNP has a preferential and specific relationship with alcohol use disorder. Okay, so here's what a Manhattan plot, or a Miami plot, because it's two Manhattan plots superimposed on one another, one's flipped, so you've got the Miami skyline and then its reflection in, um, I don't know, the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf. <laughs> um, uh, here's what it looks like for the psychotic disorders factor. So what we see is we've got a whole bunch of hits for this general dimension of liability that's associated with bipolar and depression. Um, in fact, um, we find 12 independent hits that weren't significant in the original summary statistics that, in, that were used in this analysis. So we're actually increasing our power to some extent. Um, we also have six Q hits. So these are six uh, 
variants that are that have effects on either schizophrenia or bipolar that are inconsistent with them just acting on the general dimensions. They're probably um, variants that are um, that, that are specific to one or the other disorder. Um, and so generally speaking, even though we have some Q hits, this is a pattern that is very much consistent with the idea that the factor model is working for a large portion of the SNPs. And again, the factor model, because the factor doesn't explain all of the heritable variants, we would actually expect there to be, even when the factor model is correct, some SNPs that are heterogeneous. Here is an example of where the factor model is completely implausible. And these are real data. So this comes from the Gratzinger uh, preprint uh, for, with the 11 disorders. Here we fit a hierarchical model where we've got a p-factor superimposed on our four disorder um, uh, group factors. So we've got the individual disorders, there's 11 of them on the bottom. Then we've got the four factors, can, let me see if I can remember them, internalizing, compulsive, psychotic, and neurodevelopmental. And then on top of those, they, those are genetically correlated, so we specify a general factor that underlies your general liability to, towards all the disorders. You discover on that factor, discover on that P factor, and you get virtually no genome-wide significant hits for the factor, but you get 69 heterogeneous hits. So you get 69 genetic variants that definitely operate inconsistently across the traits, so in a, in a, in a way that is, that is not proportional to their loadings on the higher order factor. This is, there's very little evidence for signal that's relevant for the general dimension, but lots of signal that violates it. This is an example of, of a situation in which I would say that this P factor is um, both a model that is wrong and a model that is not useful. Okay, so the last thing I, 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 I want to touch on, I, um, I can do it in just a couple of minutes, is the idea that um, we don't just need to fit factor models. I mean, a lot of people think of structural equation modeling as just factor models. Yeah? Sorry, just a question on that conclusion. I mean, could it be the case that at the phenotypic level, these are all correlated so that there's common environmental shocks that influence all the factors, even if at the genetic level they're distinguishable? Yeah, that's, that's certainly true, right? So that wouldn't explain the genetic correlations between them, but it would explain the phenotypic correlations. So we're in a situation in which the, the factor model actually fits the genetic correlation matrix really well as long as there's no SNPs in it. So we've got positive correlations between all four factors. We fit a, a factor on top of those four factors, and it recaptures the pattern of genetic correlations fairly well. So, but even though these, the, the, the four factors are genetically correlated, the level of the SNPs and even though the genetic correlation matrix is fairly well approximated by the P factor, the level of SNPs, it just doesn't, doesn't work. So, so common environmental factors that are uncorrelated with genetics would explain phenotypic correlations, but we still don't have an explanation for genetic correlations that involves the P factor in a plausible way. Could, it could be a sort of nighttime compound in the LDSC estimates. And so some sort mm -hmm. of sort of nighttime relating to psychiatric educational, whatever, cognitive things. Yeah, you, you yeah. meet your spouse at, at, in treatment, in the treatment group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then I guess these are strong, like strong effect SNPs, right, that you're seeing the heterogeneity. Yeah, so these tend to be SNPs that are associated with the different disorders, but in a way that is like completely um, heterogeneous. So maybe they're like really strongly associated with the neurodevelopmental disorders, but not at all associated with the psychotic disorders, for example. No, whereas I guess the, the LDSC correlations are driven by the genome-wide, you know, heritability, right? So there's, there's some difference there. All right, so, so, I mean, you're the expert on these sort of mating, or maybe Patrick is, but um, I guess my question is, would we expect genetic correlations to be confounded by sort of mating more so than, than individual SIMP effects? Yeah, well, this is some of the within family stuff that, that we've been doing as you see things that are apparently apparently have quite strong genetic correlations. And when you use standard GUS summary statistics, but when you use the within family effects, it goes away completely. But, but would they also the nature of the bias and the GUS effects the same as LBST uh well, genetic correlations. Hmm. Like heritability estimates and the and, and the uh but that's the thing, it's the correlation you're normalizing by these yeah. H squared. So 
these can be quite small things, but then when you when you turn it into a correlation parameter, something like a sort of mating can be driving a lot of that correlation parameter, even if it doesn't drive a lot of the you know, heritability for an individual trait. If there's this cross-trait sort of mating or structure type thing going on in the population where you know, risk for psychiatric things is structured in the population. I, I don't know if it's true. There's yeah, no I, evidence for this analysis <laughs> when it comes to psychiatric things. Yeah, but I mean, I, if I could... Even for mm -hmm. like BMI and educational attainment, you see this genetic correlation in, in the population, the standard GWAS semi-specific, in the direct effects, it goes away. It does go away. That's super interesting. Yeah, so, so, so I think that, like, I do not want to um, try to resist this, this criticism because I think it's a fair one. Um, but I guess I am, like, the, the GWAS betas are obviously not standardized by the heritabilities, so they're smaller, but I just, I guess I'm curious as to, but they're smaller both due to, uh, um, due to the direct effects and due to the sort of mating, and ma the, the relative, I mean, I guess I would just still, even though they're small, I might expect it, the sort of mating to inflate even the individual SNP betas, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it would inflate the individual SNP betas a bit, but... Um, but you think it's compounded by LDC? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to know exactly what's explaining some of these <laughs> results, but a sort of mating seems to be, or some kind of structure in the population, seems to be a, a decent hypothesis. Yeah, so what we could do, I mean, we don't have the data for this, but we could do what you propose, which is do all this with LD squared regression applied to within family uh, direct effects and yeah. see how it turns out. Now, that, that said, so while we're on, on, yeah. on you know, uh, started opening up the criticism of this, I mean, well, I'll, first I'll say, um, you know, we make it pretty clear, I think, in our discussion that we inherit all of the challenges of LD squared regression when we're modeling correlation, genetic correlations that are produced by LD squared regression. But, you know, there's some other things. So, you know, the, the one really big thing is a differential diagnosis. If someone comes in to the clinic and they are like strung out and kind of talking it, uh, about things that don't make a ton of sense, they could be in a manic episode, they could have a psychotic break, even if a psychiatrist is pretty good at distinguishing between those people, if the psychiatrist still misdiagnoses 20% of them, that could be enough to induce a genetic correlation between the two because you've got some people with schizophrenia in your bipolar sample and people with bipolar in your schizophrenia sample, and now you're GWASing the two, and you've basically got cross-contamination leading to genetic sharing, not because of sharing between the true disorder, if there is such a thing, but genetic sharing uh, due to just the cross-contamination. I mean, the prior plausibility for shared biology is, is high here, I think. So it is a bit different from the stuff like EA and, and BMI is a bit different, I guess. But, but, so, okay, so getting to that point, so one of the kind of, dis the, the didn't have enough time slides that I have is, tr is to direct people to what we refer to as stratified genomic SEM. So we've, in this paper, what we do is we also do, you know, our version of stratified LD score regression with a factor model superimposed, and we identify um, uh, categories of, uh, of, uh, of genetic variants that um, are enriched uh, for, for instance, psychotic disorders, and they tend to be in things, you know, related to uh, synaptogenesis, synaptic pruning, brain, you know, brain, brain biology. So, you know, I think in terms of the biological plausibility of this, you, you can make an argument that, that, that it's fairly high for that reason as well. But I mean, both schizophrenia and, disor and bipolar disorder are disease of the brain, so perhaps mm -hmm. it's not super validating. But this could just be that the strong effects in it tend to be like uh, disorders, more disorder specific than, than the weak effect ones. So. Well, that's another, that's an interesting idea. I mean, that is possible. Right, so we could do we could do the stratified analyses by um, well, I guess by by minor little frequency would get at, at r squared a bit. No, it's a good question. I, I mean, I have to think through that. Um, but I mean, what it is saying because you have a whole ton of hits for schizophrenia and bipolar and major depression in the contributing data, and they go away when you aggregate across them. What that's saying is that 
every genome-wide significant hit for schizophrenia is being offset by it being very not significant for major depression, su such that the hit is going away at the level of the P factor, yeah. or some other combination of traits. But same idea. Um, you know, we are by aggregating across these these GWASs, we're making a lot of hits go away, and that is not very consistent with the idea that, that there are SNPs that affect all 11 disorders. So I think that's the kind of take home message here. And these are all awesome points. Um, I, do, I can, I, I can s uh, explain GWAS by subtraction very quickly in a couple slides, and then we probably need to break. Um, so we can take the IQ GWAS, remove its signal from the educational attainment GWAS, estimate the SNP effect on educational attainment unique of IQ. This is how I like to draw this diagram. It's mathematically exactly the same as the Koleski diagram that Michelle put in the Demange et al. paper. Um, we call that, uh, that GWAS beta a, an effect on education uh, unique of IQ or the non-cognitive genetics, the non-cognitive component of education. Here's the uh, Manhattan plots for the cognitive component, which is just the IQ GWAS, and then the non-cognitive component, which is the EA minus the IQ GWAS. And what's pretty cool here is that the cognitive and non-cognitive components oftentimes have differential association, genetic associations with collateral phenotypes, sometimes even opposing associations. So we are breaking apart signal that is, uh, we're not just kind of rediscovering the same thing we found for educational attainment in the two components, but we're actually able to find portions of the educational attainment GWAS that are actually picking up on different sorts of heritable traits than um, other portions. So the two examples that I, that I highlighted here are conscientiousness, which is a personality trait ha having to do with planfulness and organization. The non-cognitive component is positively correlated with conscientiousness, whereas the cognitive component is negatively correlated with conscientiousness. So people who tend to do better on IQ tests, tend, uh, tend to have genetic profiles that are associated with being less planful and organized. People who do well in school for reasons, n or go further in school for reasons unrelated to their intelligence tend to be people who are more planful and organ organized. Tends to pass the smell test. Right, Ted? <laughs> okay. Schizophrenia is another example. The non-cognitive component is uh, genetically, uh, of, of, in, of education is genetically positively correlated with schizophrenia, the cognitive is negatively. What does that mean in layman's terms? Mm -hmm. That if you've got a genetic profile that is associated with risk for schizophrenia, you're also likely to go further in school. Why might that be? Well, there's been some interesting papers indicating that uh, relatives of people with schizophrenia are creative, artistic, intellectual types maybe having a good dose of schizophrenia genetics, but not enough to get you all the way into the clinical range, is associated with being very interested in uh, the arts and in and, and education. Schizophrenia is also known to be associated with cognitive deficits. People with schizophrenia often have poor test scores, and in fact, there's been evidence to show that people who have cognitive deficits uh, who have schizophrenia in the family and have cognitive deficits are more likely than those without co cognitive deficits in schizophrenia to go on to develop the disorder. So cognitive deficits are associated with schizophrenia, and so we see that the cognitive component is associated with schizophrenia in the direction of lower scores associated with higher schizophrenia mm -hmm. genetics, whereas the non-cognitive component, which probably taps things like openness, creativity, intellectualism, is positively associated with the non-cognitive component. Uh, so what's the Z-Wiz for the big five traits? Where's the that from? Oh, man. Um, there's the, there, there was a consortium that published some big five GWASs, I think, in the early two, tw uh, 2010s, like 2012 or something. They're really underpowered. They kind of suck. Um, uh, 23andMe also. Oh, except for neuroticism, because you also get U it in UK by a bank. But the other four, you, they're really, they have real crappy power. But if you sign an agreement with 23andMe, which my collaborators did, and they did the analyses in Amsterdam, and Ted and Maggie and I are still waiting for our signed collaboration to be honored by 23andMe, um, uh, then you can boost that quite a bit. And then you've got pretty good power for genetic correlation. Not for discovery as much, but for genetic correlation. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no. 
Yeah, thanks, Ollie. This is super interesting. I, I was wondering why I have two questions. Earlier you showed the um, that the association between education and schizophrenia and bipolar was operating through bipolar. And then here you're showing the unique fits for schizophrenia and bipolar. Are you taking into account that covariance between schizophrenia and bipolar? No, so each one of these lines or rows, I guess, is um, not, it's not unique of all the others. That'd be an interesting analysis to do. Be, yeah. There might be a collinearity problem because you have a lot of predictors, but that'd be an inter interesting analysis to do. The other thing is, as I mentioned before, that original um, analysis that I put up, we were trying to replicate, um, qualitatively replicate some findings from a method called uh, genome-wide inferred summary statistics that Michel had developed earlier um, with some like math genius that was his undergraduate intern, actually. And they did it with old sum stats, so we just wanted to use the same sum stats. But here we're using, as of the time of publication, the most recently available sum stats. So there may also be a reason for inconsistency there. But the primary thing going on is that these are not conditional on the other correlates. And then my other question is, what is the mind and the eyes? Oh, man, this is used by, um, by uh, Dr. Baron Cohen, not the not Sasha, but his brother, I guess. <laughs> cousin. Co yeah, cousin. Um, it's a uh, it's it's uh, being able to basically like uh, infer people's mental state from just looking at them, and it's it's a it's a marker of autistic traits. And um, yeah, Baron Cohen, I think, is a big autism researcher. He's gotten into GWAS, and I think they this is also something the mind and the eyes score comes. I think that comes from UK Bio. I think. So the higher the score, the more autistic. I, be I believe I believe that it's the the, the my, that you do better at inferring people's um, uh, psychology from their, um, uh, their their mental states from looking at them. So I mean, you can I, do it online. Like there's a that okay. Yeah, but I th yeah I think the direction is in higher scores are, are less autism. I believe. Okay, that, yeah. That's uh, yes. also, my other question would have been, and it's related to the concept of genetic correlation, and uh, how can we think about it? So, for example, the association between schizophrenia and the non-cognitive component, could it be some sort of vertical pleiotropy where people that really try to do well at school, they end up being psychotic? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about that. You know, I'll, 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 I'll tell you one thing that, that I've found very interesting, which is that there used to be in these selected samples, this is, this is me dodging the question a little bit, uh, in these selected samples, a really strong negative association between uh, conscientiousness and IQ. And it turns out that that is due to collider bias, by and large, because in order to get into you know, a good university, you need to either be well organized or smart. And you can be both, but you can't be neither. So you're missing the lower left quadrant of that scatter plot, and it produces a negative correlation. So I was actually a little bit surprised that we even got that negative correlation, genetic correlation here, because um, I don't think. Well, you know, I, a lot of these samples are probably they're not they're not university admitted students, but they're probably positively selected. So perhaps that could cause some of it. That doesn't get at your question, but but I th I do think that there's a lot of interpretation left to be had for these associations. Um, I think, um, yeah, let me just mention, we put a lot of effort into worked through examples on the wiki. So if you want to actually implement this, what you should be able to do is go to our wiki and start from the very top and install, you, you get the code to install the package in R, and then you get the code to run the analyses using the publicly variable summary statistics that we provide links to, and you should be able to replicate every single analysis in our wiki yourself. I think Ted did that before he came. And then you should be set to adapt it for your own sorts of analyses. So I often find, I don't do a lot of the programming myself generally, but like when I do like try to look up other people's software, you know, all it does is it gives you some git with a URL and it's just is like, have fun. And we, we do, we, we, we try to make it more accessible. And so, uh, and we also have a forum. So it, you know, we really want people to be able to use, use this stuff, and we want to be able to answer questions. So um, please do feel free to reach out if you, you know, stumble into something. All right. Oh, and so the, the two, the two uh, directions I didn't talk about is transcriptome-wide genomics, which uh, uses 
uh, estimates from fusion, which uh, basically imputes gene, gene expression on the basis of gene uh, sequence. So you've, you've got a GWAS uh, for a trait, you've got a, an e, a, a, like an EWAS for gene expression, and you basically take the betas. It's basically two sample of Mendelian randomization that you heard about yesterday. And you, um, you infer what the effect is of the gene expression on the outcome. And now you can do that on factors, for example, or in GWAS by subtraction. And then the other is stratified genomic sums. So you can fit these models um, and look at whether or not there's enrichment or depletion for signal in different um, pre-specified categories uh, using annotations, for instance, that I, you probably heard about uh, with respect to stratified LDSC. So yeah, that's it.